Right. So good afternoon, everybody. And uh, we will kind of chat today about my availability at payments and stuff for this week coming up here, right? Um, we also spoke about where we are in the syllabus. We just came up the syllabus and back with same, same 2.3. And what I was saying, I want to focus, right? It's 41 side of 91. I want to focus. You all have your books. Those who don't have it, it's at the office. I want to focus on try to finish up this, right? Um, so Wednesday, we could start chapter three, right? And it's not long after that. And I mean, I just show you the syllabus, right? You all have the syllabus too. It's not long after that, right? Um, what what you could be doing in the meantime though is uh start your studies, right? Like go through a couple of passages. But we look at one today. Start committing some things to memory. The things that you know that we shouted now, like uh, things like uh vapor density. Those kind of things, you know, like, uh, I mean, some of them like definitions, right? But like, uh, we haven't done all either, right? Safe operating envelope and stuff, we haven't done all of that as yet, right? Uh, but what, what you have seen in the past paper, uh, you could start to revise and what you see in the PowerPoint, you can start to commit to memory again. Just give me half a second here and I'll be back with you, all right? All right, so I'm going straight to that, right? So the role and purpose and features of a permit to work um, from Wednesday night technique, I think I, I read and I explained, I think I'll do the same thing. That's about the only way we could finish without putting it to sleep, right? So a permit to work is a formal written system used to control certain types of work that has a high hazard potential. That's the main thing there. Like, there's a question right here to like, when is a permit, like, Define the term permit to work, right? So it, it is a written document. It's referred to as a safe system of work and is actually meant to control those um, job activities that are seen to be high risk. The proper thing to say, though, um, which is like the degree thing to say, right? The proper thing to say is high hazard potential. So that's what you see there. But the common person on the street may say high risk. But the proper thing is really high hazard protection, right? But you can say high risk. I'm sure you can say high risk. And I feel you're getting back still, right? But as a tutor now, we have to put the correct thing as high hazard protection, right? Um, it includes the people, equipment, materials, and the environment involved in the system. The permit to work also includes the mechanism to control the work. To ensure it is done in the correct way, such as supervision and confirming signatures on the permit document. But I was putting it mildly. A permit does way more than that. And we'll get, we'll get into it, right? I mean, the permit, the permit does have a way to control the high hazard potential activity. Supervision is the least of it, to be honest, right? I mean, it have so much more good things than a permit. I'll have to pinpoint them in a bit, right? But um, yeah, supervision and signatures are there. That's just two things in the permit. The permit is much more powerful than that. We'll talk about that in a bit. Role and purpose of and features of a permit to work. Uh, so it specifies the work to be done, which is something like hot work, you know, like uh it have to be something high risk, right? Working on height, working on um an excavation, welding, it had to be something high risk, right? Because permit is meant for those activities that have a high hazard potential. Right? Um it predetermines the safe procedure for the work. Well, it tells you like how to get it done in a safe way, right? It is a clear record that foreseeable hazards have been considered in advance. And actually, if you, if you don't know, a permit has a risk assessment attached to it. Like one of the requirements is there, like, is there a permit attached, right? It defines the appropriate sequence in which the work is to be carried out. It sets out responsibilities of those involved in the permit. Just one of the persons is called an authorized person. It have more persons on the permit, right? Like the supervisor, like the welder, like the operator, like the whole watch. It have a lot of people like the gas tester. A lot of people have to sign that permit. But one of them is the authorized person. And the authorized person is the one that is in control of the permit. That's the person that have, how do you say, that's the person that have the permit in their hand. Like if you're looking for the permit, that's the person with the permit, right? They will have it in their hand. They'll have it in their office. They are referred to as the authorized person. They say that person um, issues the permit. 
So that person will not be, it's uniform to all the other persons we, 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 we can actually mention there. And that person actually cancels the permit. I'll talk about that too just now. The yeah, permit has to be cancelled. It's a kind of strange document. Why does it have to be cancelled? Well, one of the headings on it is actually cancellation. Like one of the headings is supervision. And one of the headings is risk assessment. But one of the headings is cancellation. And who cancels it is the authorized person, right? Um, the, 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 the high risk there, the high risk activity should not be going on forever. Like cleaning a tank. Is not a forever task, right? Well, it is not a forever task either. So when the task is finished, whatever controls they had around the well, whatever controls they had around the tank, whatever controls they had around the excavation, would have to get back to normal, right? If it was an excavation, you may have read, you know, directed traffic somewhere else. You may have put up a portion tape, hard barriers, but that's because you excavated. Right, and if you clean in a tank, you would have you know close up the oil line, but the oil line can stay closed off. Remember, it's oil lines don't come from space, right? They come from a well, and the well is normally pumping, so you don't want to keep that well done for a long time because remember, oil is money, right? So the valves have to turn back on, the tank have to fill back with oil, but when the work is going on, then right, you know the valves have to be closed, so there is a need for life to go back to normal, if you want to say it like that. And that's what they call cancellation. And the authorized person does that. The authorized person should should make sure that they, if, it, if you're talking about cleaning a tank, right, make sure the contractors have, you know, finished the task. If it was cleaning the tank, painting the tank, welding the tank, whatever, right? Um, make sure the contractors have come out of the tank, the authorized person make sure the tank doors, well, they probably would have checked, checked out the job, right? If it needs, you know, getting inside there themselves and making sure that the welding was okay and if it was painting. And so if it was any sort of test that had to be done, you know, I don't know if you all know about welding tests and stuff, right? So that, so the, once all of that is finished, then life can go back to normal and, and the authorized person, this person here, it's responsible for what he calls signing off on under cancellation, meaning that the job has been completed and then life goes back to normal. The valves can be turned back on. Oil can begin to flow back into that vessel. Delivery trucks could come and collect it, carry it to tank farm, sell it for money. Life could go back to normal, right? So the, so the authorized person is like, I'll say it again, it's like that's one of the key persons in this. I don't think... Um, they are more important. But why I say key is that they control the document now. Like, does the person that have it, the authorized person. Think you understand that? I do think the well is important. The contractor going in the tank is important. And everybody have to sign. The authorized person is really not more important than anybody else. But if you're looking for the permit, they say who have the permit, it will be the authorized person. Who have a copy of it, it will be the authorized person, right? So um, the permit, again, confirms that critical steps have been taken and by whom, and that could be everybody. That could be the well, uh, the supervisor, um, and everybody in it. So a permit to work should be used whenever the method by which the task is done or is to be done is likely to be critical to the health and safety of those involved. That's why they say it's meant for high-risk activities or high-hazard potential, right? The type of work may involve hot work, just reading one or two of them, right? Entry into confined spaces, Work and pressurized vessels, coal work, and electrical work. Permitted work, uh, typically formalized, pre printed forms. Yes, you can get them free online. Well, you can tweak them as well, but you can get a free one online, right? Um, these are used to specify the hazards likely to be present, and the controls are uh, in use, such as electrical isolation. Well, that's a big headed. One of the big headed other permits is the word isolation, right? So that's like one of the ways this piece of paper, this pre-printed form, could save your life. How could a piece of paper save your life? Well, if you're going into the tank, if you're going into a vessel, if you're, in, you're going into electrical work, and the first thing it says, isolate, right? For those who know what isolate means, isolate means turn off and prevent from turning back on. A lot of companies have created ways of doing that. They'll have like a lock, like if it's a valve, some of them, they take off the valve head. 
but it's at their device. I don't know. I don't have I don't have a picture of it here, right? But it's actually something called a uh, a, a lotto device, lock out and tag out. It is like a clamp, if you want to think of it like that, if you know what a clamp is. You have seen a clamp, a clamp that could clamp a vehicle or whatever, right? But if it wasn't removing the valve, there's like a clamp that goes on top of the valve and it clamps and you lock it. But it clamps, that's it's called a clamp, right? So nobody could put on that valve, right? So when the well is in the tank, when the divers are in the dive, right? Nobody should be allowed to turn on a valve. You, because you can't, there's a clamp on the valve, right? So that's what isolation means. So I was telling you, like, um, isolation is one of the powerful words on a permit. This one word could save your life. That one word could, if on the permit said isolate the the grain if you're in a, a silo, it means no grain could come if you're inside there because you isolate. Isolate means turn off and prevent from turning back on, right? And it's not a joke. I tell you, it's a device they use, something called lockout and tag out, um, lotto. So there shouldn't be any fear then of somebody putting on a valve, you know, to create pressure into the system, right? If isolation was done, the only way that clamp is removed is by the authorized person when he comes and he verifies, he or she verifies that the welders are out of the town, the contractors are out of the construction pit. And the person outside, you're seeing them, they change their clothes, you know, everything is okay, you do your gas testing, everything is okay, the tank has been bolted back on, the excavation has been, you know, whatever, right? Maybe cordon off, whatever. Then the person will remove the isolation and put on back the valve and the grain silo, whatever, have you, right? That's the only way. So this one word and one document, if done the right, we have the potential to save your life. And for those of us in Trinidad, we all know the potential. If you don't do this, because some companies do that. Some, co but we all know the company, right? That starts with P, right? But it wasn't just them. It was actually uh, Piper Alpha 2 in the UK, right? It was actually a lot of companies around the world that, that what some companies do, it have dangerous work. It have work on height. It have electrical work. It have welded. But what they do, they just get it done. And I hope you don't end up in a company like that. And if you do, stand up for yourself. Right? Stand up for yourself. So, like, what they do it for those of us who work, I, I show some of y'all work here. Uh, if you work in the fields, a lot of y'all have your cameras off, right? A lot of y'all would know that around half past three, if you finish at four. In fact, in fact, some companies by three o'clock, by three o'clock, you start to wind up. They say clean up, clean up your hands, clean up your whatever. If you have detergents, whatever, clean up. I have past three, so I'm going to complete the forms under. But that's not, that's not how we're supposed to do it. And that's what Paris was doing, right? So, like, that was the culture. And I know, I know, my mother, I work, you know, people, like some of y'all know me here, right? Um, that That's what, before Paris, that's what Petrogen was always doing. That was just the norm. You know, you kind of do the work and afterwards, because my mother, I work with a contractor. Half past three, you finish, then I worked in other companies too. Half past three, you finish, and then you follow the forms. And that is what led to this disaster. And the thing is, it was safety, isn't it? It was safety. It was some of them were safety students who were students in this school here. But nobody stood up. Nobody stood up and said, let's do the thing before. Let's make sure it have suitable rescue. Let's make sure the valves in them really close off. Let's make sure nobody could put on back a, an adjacent valve. Nobody did that. Everybody just kind of boil up and take money. Right? So anyway, it can form a logical link between a method statement and can also be considered in task analysis. Well, in a way, a permit is a kind of task analysis because you're looking at the task and you're considering what's the hazard and how you can reduce it, right? Task analysis consists of a formal step-by-step -step review of the work to be carried out. The operations of a permit to work would involve ensuring the proper authorization of the specified work, confirmation of the identity, nature, timing, extent, and limitation of the work, establishing criteria to be considered when identifying hazards and what they are, confirmation that hazards have been removed where possible, confirmation that work has been started or suspended, conducted, and finished safely, confirmation of who has control of the location equipment relating to the work when it is passed between parties, and that's supposed to be, again, the authorized person and maybe a contractor, 
controlling change and considering other work activities that might interact with specified work, providing a record that the steps in the permit to work have been followed. All right, so some of the people we have the permit issuer, which is the authorized person issuing authority, ensures that the permit to work are written correctly, specifying all the necessary risk controls in terms of, in terms, sorry, risk control terms and conditions that are applicable to the type of work being completed. Permit receiver, and there, there are actually more than one receiver. Yeah, there's a supervisor. There is a, probably another supervisor who have to sign. Then there's the operative, which is maybe somebody like the contractor. Then it have the man who really going in the tank. It have the well lab. It have the contractor who really going into the pit. When I say the contractor, not the contractor, contractor, the actual worker that go along in the pit, that person have to sign to, right? So there's more than one. It have the whole watch. The whole watch is a receiving party too, right? Um, so, that, so there's a lot There's a lot of spaces on the permit. Supervisor, supervisor, operator, contractor, contractor, employee, laborer, welder, whatever the work is. And everybody have to sign in a way that the thing is safe. Like if you were the man going in the pit, or you were the wala going into, into the tank, or you're the painter going into the tank, and you realize, you know, look, I mean, like if you realize, okay, like under PPE, PPE is a head and a permit, like they didn't provide you with suitable PPE. I would just suitable because I, I gave a couple of scenarios. I don't know which one to zone or what, right? But then if you were the painter, then you are not supposed to sign. If you are the person going into a tank and, and under emergency rescue, you see NA. Emergency rescue is a heading on the permit, right? Or isolation. So you see NA. So you say, well, what is this? They say, well, you know, the, the emergency team cancel, they get caught up in traffic. But you had to wait. I don't know if you all know that. In IEL, I remember we waited till 10 o'clock. Come to work 7 o'clock to start a job and we couldn't start until 10 o'clock. You couldn't, you cannot. If the rescue team somewhere is, you have to wait on them. Right? You have to wait on them. Because people don't like that. But that's what you're supposed to do. And if you is the welder, you are the contractor, and you decide to go in the tank, well, you see what happened. You see what happened. Right? Okay, you're yeah. signing away your life. Right? Gas you're signing away your life. Right? What about gas tested? Yes, anybody? Question? Yes, well, um, concerning the permitting, these are um, relevant documents. Be aside with it, like ventilation plan, rescue plan. So, if your permit package don't have a ventilation and a rescue plan, it didn't complete. Your car utilize it. Yeah, but how they, it in, how, how they do it in Paria, Stephen? How they do it in Paria? Oh, well, I, I'm not sure. <laughs> exactly. They didn't do it. Yeah. There were students here, you know, just like you, right? There were students of mine here, right? But nobody stand up for what was right. Nobody stand up for what was right. Including the divers who was accustomed to going in the diver. When you finish, then you sign in the permit, you're putting your life on the line. Right? Um, so you understand this point that have more than one. You hear what Stephen said, it may have like the gas tester, it may have like um auxiliary documents then, right? Like the first aid, like I would want to know. I have done one of this. I did one of this while working a huge chimney with the better statement. I didn't allow anybody to do anything without the ambulance being there. Right? So if the ambulance stick, stick up somehow, we had to wait. We had to wait because you remember if something happened now, you know, I mean, look what happened. I mean, other than other than the thing with, with law and lawsuit and, you know, publicity, it have the fact that somebody die under your watch. Right? All right, so... Where am I, right? So permit receiver, permit users, ensure, user ensures that he or she is knowledgeable about and understand fully the hazards and risks that are associated with the work that is being completed, right? Competent person can be everybody in, on that job then, right? So adequately qualified, that's you, that's you as a contractor, yes, you know what you're doing, suitably trained. If you're going into a tank, you must know how to breathe, you must know how to use your... your, your um, self-contained breathing apparatus. You must know certain things that the gas testers, the contractors, you wouldn't just magically appear there. You had to be somewhat competent. You must, this cannot be the first tank you're going into. This cannot be the first pipeline you're going into. 
right? So you must be adequately qualified so to be trained. And if it's the first one, you should be showing your drill record, right? With sufficient experience to safely perform work as outlined without or with only a minimal degree of supervision. Authorized gas tester is a person who is trained, not by your company. There are a couple of places in Trinidad doing the real course. Remember, this is the real Nibosh. There's only about two places in Trinidad doing the real authorized gas testing course. Anyone of y'all know where it is? You can drop it in the comment, right? If you see any say, a way saying authorized gas testing course, be careful, right? Gas testing is under an entity called OP2, like oil and gas is under an entity called Nibosh. Right, Nibosh is UK, O P T O O P I T O. <clears throat> they have the marketed gas testing there, not Nibosh. Nibosh have a you know, education and stuff, right? But the market in terms of gas testing is O P T O. There are just two O P T O centers in Trinidad, right? I don't think it have any more in the world because these people in Trinidad is the one who go into um, Guyana, right? I've actually seen them there, right? Authorized gas tester is a person who is trained, competent, and authorized to use gas testing instruments to measure gas concentration in an area where people and equipment will be working and determine the atmospheric conditions if they are safe for doing the work, right? And of course, you can learn to test so many gases. The most common one is hydrogen sulfide. But the truth is you really want to know your oxygen level is okay, 21%. Yeah, you want to know about the hydrogen sulfide. If it's oil you're going in, it will have hydrogen sulfide. You can't avoid that. You cannot get zero. If it's an oil tank you're going in or oil pit you're going in, you will get hydrogen sulfide. That's just how it is, right? You will never get zero because remember it's an oil tank you're going into H2S is one of the um the residue that gases in the in the sludge of the tank. If they drain a tank or you drain a pit, that oily sludge has hydrogen sulfide in it, right? They would have ventilated the tank, but remember if you're going to clean the tank. It have hydrogen sulfide. You can't avoid it. They would have ventilated, make sure it come down to a certain concentration. You would never get zero because that's the, that's what you, that's the work you're going to do. You're going to clean it out, right? All right. The key features of a permit to work, it will contain the scope of work, the duration of work. The duration sometimes can be five hours, four hours, two hours, one hour, 30 minutes, 24 hours. It all depends, right? Um, no one hazards and reference to risk assessments, isolation of energy sources or processes equipment. We mentioned the lockout tagout, and it must be linked to any other permit or any other work that may be adjacent to your work anyway. Features of a permit to work, um, specification of persons accepting the permit and verification of their understanding of the risk and control measures. Are there emergency controls? It should be. Are there specific controls such as for gas testing? Yes, they should be, right? A permit to work can serve as a means of obtaining or passing on information on hazards and control between simultaneous operations or with adjacent plants. That's what they should have done. If you know it have another contractor, even if the person is 200, uh, 200 meters from you, 100 meters is about three light poles. If the person is another compound, but it's the same line, that passing in it have a valve there to open it, well, they should have gotten a copy of your permit as well. Saying, look, in this part of the compound, we have isolated the line here, right? Now, who knows, like, what happened in Paris? They could have had another line that created a suction. An adjacent contractor should be given what is called a simultaneous. If a simultaneous operation going on, they must be given a copy of your permit as well, right? It can serve as an interface between contractors and various shifts. And of course, if it's not an if not an interface, it could result in a disaster. That's what happened in Piper Alpha, right? One shift did one thing and they didn't inform the night shift. Night shift didn't know what you all know the story they put on a line and it resulted in a massive explosion that killed 167 people, I think. Right? Interface with adjacent plant contractors. It is essential that the permit issuer, which is the authorized person considers the potential impact of the work on adjacent plants and equipment. So what's next to you? Best achieved by having a central issue in authority or location, the permit must be clearly displayed wherever you're working. And even if it is an adjacent plant, right? Must be issued to both contractors and workers by the issue in authority, which is the authorized person. The authorized person, um, if you want to know who that is, in most companies, as a safety manager. It doesn't have to be, though. It doesn't have to be. I'm sure you all know that. It could be somebody in facilities. Once 
what makes an authorized person an authorized person is like they have experience in the job now, right? The authorized person could be a project manager. I'll show you all know that. The project manager, right? He or she could be the authorized person to issue the permit and cancel the permit. So they have the issue into the safety. So the safety doesn't have to be the authorized person. If you have a hands-on manager, like maybe there is a... But you all know the names better than me. No? Those of us who so work, right? Um, project manager, one, safety lead, one, whatever, whatever, right? Um, you know, uh, that person, like the, 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 what they're trying to say, you as a, a new student to the field of health and safety, not because you have your level three or your level four or your level five, it means that they would automatically choose you to be the authorized person. Now. It doesn't work like that, right? Like, you can have your level three, level four, level five, but there is somebody there who they may have a degree in something else. They may have a degree in engineering, like petroleum engineering. But that person have been on the plant. That's the senior manager. That's the Sean. I'm just making up a name, right? So so that's the Sean. And, and uh, Sean, is he has done this work, shut down work, tank cleaning, vessel, catalyst removal for the last 10 years. He's a guy. So you, you with your knee, Bosch, now you may be the... The, the authorized person in years to come, but it it doesn't have to be that that is you. It have to be somebody that's competent who knows what's going on, right? So make sure you understand that a bit. Um, must be issued to board contractors and workers by the issuing authority, which is the authorized person. I think somebody dropped something on the chat. Let's see. Right, yes, Hummingbird. Well. Who we call Hummingbird HHSL. If you look at the chat, that is one of they, they are the cheapest. And I, I do have a lot of dealers with them. You all know me, those of us who know me, you know, you know, we know um the 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 the, the manager there personally anyway. He was a student of our school, right? Um, you know, and he's one of many, right? We could call the other people inside there as well, right? But uh, yeah, so Hummingbird HHSL is one of the approved centers for the Obito gas testing. And uh, I would tell it, don't do that course unless if you feel like if you know you're in the office, don't do it now. Like if you apply for a job and you get through, and as a safety, they say, okay, they want you to take on the role of, you know, they, they join into that committee that, that does gas testing, they will pay for it for you. Don't waste your time there. Don't waste your time for one get it done because if you get through as a safety, you now it doesn't mean you'll be automatically you know, an authorized gas tester. A lot of companies don't even trust their own employees to do that. They will hire independent companies to do it, like HS, um, HSSL, right? So you going and doing that course doesn't do anything. You can't get anything to do with it, right? Because they will have their, like internal staff doesn't sometimes do a good job then. They want an independent report saying, look, the oxygen concentration is 21%. The methane concentration is 0.04%. The carbon dioxide concentration is 0.03%, which is where it's supposed to be. And these things are the normal percentage I call them for y'all, right? So you like 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 you want to report that from an independent company state and that. So just be careful where you go. Like Nibosh, okay. The reason why you're doing Nibosh is because you see that on the job vacancies, right? But if you see a vacancy that requires to do gas testing, fine. Other than that. It's, it's not like a must then. It's not like something you have to do. If, like I said, you have been placed into that role, then and only that, you should do it. And of course, the truth is, if they put you in that role, then, which, which I doubt, that's why I doubt in it, because I know companies use independent people, right? But if they put you in that role, then they should pay for you to get it done, right? So just be careful. And sometimes when we mention this in class, a lot of people call up um, Hummingbird and say, you know, look, Shadrach, say, go and do a gas testing course. I never said that. Because you're wasting your money. By the way, it's a good course. Eh? Opito level one, two, and three is a very good course. You can check it up when you get some time. Later on in life, you can probably get that, right? So lockout tagout or lock and tag is a safety procedure which is used in the industry and research setting to ensure that dangerous machines are properly shut off and not able to be started up again prior to the completion of maintenance or repair work. Isolation and repair to, sorry, isolation and permit to work isolation where maintenance required that normal garden is removed or access is required inside existing garden. 
then additional measures are needed to prevent dangers of the mechanical, electrical, and other hazards that may be exposed, right? Um, that could be a lot of hydraulic machines uh, where you have to, like, like any manufacturing sector then, right? So you're pressing out a fender, you're pressing out part of a vehicle then, or pass of another component, right? So the machine press it, but then you want to turn it. Or if the machine turn it and paint it, you still have to go and get it, right? So if anything like that, there would have to be, you know, like, um, for you to get in there, then the machine must be isolated. I don't know if you all know what a captive key control system is. It's not in this course. But I'll tell you, a captive key control. In fact, I know I just thought of one. You know why I thought of one? Because I was doing that this morning, right? Um, if you have a, a washer, dryer, the traditional one, right? With the, with the rinse section, right? So if you know what I'm talking about, you can say, right? if you open that rinse section, so you put your clothes to, to, to rinse out then, right? And uh, so you set it on whatever time, I don't know, five minutes, 10 minutes, right? Because you know the modern ones, you can't open them. Like if you lock it into that heater dryer business, right? Like drain, you can't open it until the sequence is finished, right? But if you have one of the traditional ones and you open it, what happens? You open it before the five minutes, what does happen? What happens if it's, if it's spinning and you open it? What happens there? Does it keep on spinning? It stops, right? And that is because there is like an electrical circuit when you put down the hood there, right? So if you open the part that is rinsing or spinning or spin drying, it breaks the electrical circuit and you realize, okay, the thing stops, right? So that is actually a means of isolation. That's actually a captive control key. So like if you have to go, that's what they call a captive control system, right? If you have to, if somebody was getting in to like remove, you know, a piece of equipment inside a garden, right? Well, what we could suggest is a captive key control. So like if you get inside, like just like open in the spin dryer, then it will shut off the machine. That's called a captive key control system, right? I don't know if you understand all of it because the washing machine is just a household example, but you could, I mean, and I don't want to draw nothing for you too, but other than that, like the rest of the machines is sort of like hydraulic machines, right? So if you get close to them, right, there'll be something that around the machine, like a sensitive mat there would be like a sensor then. So like as you get close to the machine, because you're in the guard, remember the guard is a protective fence, right? A guard is like a covering. But if you're inside the guard, watch it, or access is required inside the existing guard. So if you're inside the guard, no, you're inside the fence. You're inside the fence because you're, I mean, that's probably part of the task, right? I'm just making this up here, right? Then there would be something wrong. And those of us who know, I mean, there are many ways the simplest thing I could think about is like a sensor mat or a sensor that picks you up and stops stops the machine, right? If um there are others, you know, I mean, but it's not this course, it's actually the degree course, right? Um so there's actually one of them that uses like a laser light. Like the very presence as, as you come in, it will it will trip a light, there be a, a light beam around the machine. So yes, you're inside the physical guard, but as you come in, you, you bring the light beam, it'll trip off the machine, right? So you can look it up. Um, I don't know if you want to write down the word. You can write down two words if you want to just watch a YouTube video on it. The first one is actually like your pressure sensor mats. You can find it on the hydraulic machines, right? Huge hydraulic machines that press stuff into, you know, shape and whatever have you, right? So pressure sensor mats. And then you also have what is called um, a photoelectric light curtain, which is just a laser beam. We'll just say like a laser, but the proper name is a photoelectric light curtain, like the curtain and hanging on the window here, right? So you may have seen some about in, um, in movies or television shows that have jewelry that, you know, is being guarded. And when they would be, well, let's say they get away with it. So the teams, when they come in, 
by their body presence, then it sends off an alarm by their tripping off an alarm, right? So it's always the same thing here. If you're inside a physical mesh, you're close to a machine, this is one way to safeguard the operator. Does cost some money. And in Trinidad, if these things aren't in Guyana, if it's not being done, there have been deaths. There have been deaths around the pumping jacks. Right? In the oil field industry. Another way of any other sort of crushing injury, though. Right? There have been deaths around pumping jacks, though. Right? All right, I'm moving on. So lockout, tagout, again, safe isolation, definition, the interruption, disconnection, and separation of all equipment, both in power source, sources, in such a way that this disconnection and separation is secure by lockable means. I think we covered that already. We covered enough about lockout and tagout, right? Find the reading going slow. Um, I'll speed it up a bit, right? Lockout, tagout, and isolation, safe isolation, steps, example. So machine in your plant to stop by normal means. All residual energy reserves to be exhausted or discharged. Okay, that's a kind of technical point. I'll come back to that, right? All moving parts stop in a safe position. Uh, the electrical means must be turned off. A padlock fitted to the isolator labeled or coded to identify the owner of the lock. So who have the key to remove this lock? It's supposed to be, by the way, the authorized person, right? Main isolator must be locked off. Um, I don't want to say too much, but I want to say a bit of it. So, like, you must know if a moving machine has been brought to a stop, there's a certain amount of residual energy in it. You have to be careful. If you're not careful, it can cost your life, right? Um, a simple household example is your wipers in your car. Sometimes you turn off the wipers, but it stays on the screen. It stays on the glass then. Automatically, what do you do? What do you do automatically when your wiper stays on the, on, on the glass, like the windscreen of your car? What do you do automatically? Well, I say automatically because you really don't think about it. What do you do when the, when the wipers stay on the, on the screen of the car or the van? Turning back on for it to reset. Very good. You're turning back on to reset. Now that that automatic response have actually called deaths, have actually caused deaths a person. But not in the wiper industry, of course, right? In the equipment industry. Right? I know of one, and you probably know of some too, because we all have different experiences, right? I know of one in Quarry Village, Siparia. Should call the company. I wouldn't call the company, right? But two pump technicians, right? Pump and jack, right? In the oil field industry, of course, Lufkin turned off. Well, that's how it have to be, right? Again, I don't know if I shared this story with you all before. If you know the oil field industry, right? The, the pump and jacks on them. The switch for pumping jack is not on the jack. And then you can relate that to your experience. You have some generators and stuff there, right? The switch weight is not on the generator. It's on something called a switch pole. And the switch pole is far away. The switch pole is the end of the lot. If you think of it like a lot of land, because it's about 5,000 square feet, the switch pole is on the end of the lot. So what happened? One operator goes by the switch pole. One operator goes to the pump and jack. And this is what had happened, right? And the one at the switch pole went on, he turned off the jack. And as a pump and jack has the counterweights, you know the counterweights, right? The counterweights are turned like this. So just any windscreen wiper, sometimes when you turn them off, it's a counterweight, right? It's heavy. It stops in a downward position. Sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes it stops like that, in the upward position. Right? And what happened in this thing here, right? When it's up in the upward position, the operator by the jack, by the by the pump and jack, and he went and started to work. He just he just bent on one time. And guess what happened? The technician by the pole realizing that the counterweights are up in the air. What do you think they did automatically? They automatically Turn it back on. 
not realizing you know, the technician had bed down already there. He was actually killed. Come to his came and kill him and crush him on the ground. Right? Did he mean for that to happen? No. But that's the thing about residual energy. That's what I'm saying here, right? All residual energy reserves to be exhausted or discharged. What about a hydraulic line? Whatever is your experience, right? Draining a tank with oil. Right? Yeah, they have to drain it, right? When I say they don't drain the oil, unless if you have a pit. But normally they do something called bleeding the tank, right? They'll pump out the, um, the oil or they'll have trucks come and take out the oil and then they bleed the water out of the tank, right? Meaning they let the water go out of the tank and into like a drain or something, right? So whatever is your residual energy, right? Anybody have any similar equipment around them? But you know, like when you stop it, you can think about your washing machine again if you don't have any. Like when you stop it, it still does a bit of a spin, but the washing machine, when it dry up, that will stop almost automatically because there is an electrical circuit. When you raise the hood and it breaks the electrical circuit, it may just go for like for one more rev. But with heavy equipment, and what I'm trying to say, that one more rev could cause a crushing, a crushing injury. Anybody have any similar sort of equipment? They want to share, want to take a drink of water. But you all understand any examples they're using. I hope I'm not using anything too complicated. Trying to use household stuff, but are trying to use oil and gas stuff at the same time. Not to talk about the complicated ones, right? So not no centrifuges or nothing. A fan, yeah, that's a good one. A fan. What do you think of a fan? It does, it does still keep running. I have a fan. I don't have really, I haven't consciously thought about that. I guess it does. I have a fan right here. I guess it does, right? Um, It may give you like a one turn again. You know? Yeah. You know, yeah. like sometimes in the fan, it have the, the switch and it doesn't put it on the, like, they do have to put it on zero sometimes because sometimes it just slip and go to, to stick in the middle in one or two and yeah. cut off. Yeah. I, I've had the experience with an overhead gantry crane. Anybody know as an overhead gantry crane? Anybody knows an overhead gantry crane? You see it in the automotive industry or a lot in the construction Compounds where they have to carry pipes. The operators will have like a controller in their hand. Have you all ever seen that? Like an orange button here. You must have seen that one, man. Yes? No? And the operator controls it. So when they press stop, this thing will keep traveling. It's not supposed to do. Right? Stop or whatever you're supposed to stop. But it keeps traveling. It had one that physically people had to hold, hold back the pipes from it anyway. Right? So these things happen though, but it's all about good um, isolation, right? All right, so where more than one person requires access, then a safety clamp type should be fitted, right? So they have a little brand there, right? ITEX, so that's just a brand, right? Appropriate warning signs to be posted as a means of stopping, starting the machine. Captive key control system, so that's the washing machine to be used as a secondary means of isolation. Any one of you will ever see this or work around these things here? And if you do, if you do, right, there's actually a bit of a weakness here with these kind of things. Anybody could say what, if you had, I mean, you had a work to know what is the weakness with this? What is the weakness with this thing here? Have you ever worked around anything with these kind of, you know, cards around them? There's a weakness with the card itself. Yeah. What do you think could happen um, to that card? Well, I can understand it. It could take all the label on it. Yeah, weather condition is one, right? Sometimes when you pass, you see half of them on the ground. If rain falls or it have, you have miserable people too, huh? you have miserable people too. That will actually boost that out from there, right? But it is kind of customary if you're not keeping your eye on these things and the weather is out. If this is not laminated or whatever have you, it could actually, you'll probably end up seeing some on the ground, right? Now that may be due to weather. Hopefully it's not due to malicious intent. But not everybody in the company loves the safety. That's okay though, right? But what I say now, some people don't like safety, so they will interfere with the things. And you know, those are some normal things anyway, right? Recognition procedure example: all tools used must be stored away, and items once removed must be correctly refitted. Authorized person who installed padlock to remove it, arrangement made for shift work. Authorized person to re-inspect to ensure it is safe to reconnect energy sources. We kind of discussed that already, so I'm not going to discuss that, that again, right? 
operators to carry out their own check to reinsure that padlocks, warnings have been removed and the persons are a safe distance away, then you could go and reconnect the energy supply, right? We kind of did talk about those things already, right? All right, next thing on the syllabus, we now read slide 60. Wow. I was hoping to finish, but you see it's not reading and it's explanation, all right? Let's go straight to this one. Asset integrity is the next thing. If you go back to the syllabus, you'll see it, right? Um, I wouldn't go back as it. When we finish, I'll go back and share, right? So asset must perform effectively and efficiently to ensure safe and reliable operations and achieve your objectives. Asset integrity management ensures you have the business processes, systems, tools, competencies, and resources you need to ensure integrity throughout the life cycle of the asset. Life cycle of an asset. An asset here is a piece of equipment that ranges from design to a lot of other steps, right? Like design, um, purchasing, installing, operating, repairing, modification. Then when you finally don't want it anymore, what happens to it? Do you take it and dump it? I'm not too sure where they dump stuff in Guyana, right? But do they take it and dump it in the dumps in Guyana? Do they take it and dump it in Claxton Bay, which is in Trinidad dump? Or do they put it in the Beatum dump? It shouldn't be. It's a piece of equipment, right? Maybe you could probably um, get a decent price for it. Maybe you could sell back some components and maybe you can have it recycled or something, right? That is what they call asset integrity anyway. From design to final decommissioning, right? So these are the stages I was saying here. Maybe you could learn some of these because that's a nice question, right? The stages of an asset. Think about your phone. If the example hard for you to understand, think about your phone, right? The manufacturer of your phone, Samsung, iPhone, whatever, right? They would have done the design. They have the specs of your phone, right? So, you know, commissioning the, that particular model of phone, you operating it, you modifying it, you downloading a software, right? And then what happens to the phone? What happens to the phones now when we are finished with them? I know that's a good business plan to go into. I have a bunch of them. I'm sure, I'm sure we all do. I'm sure we all have old phones, right? But I know some people take them. I know some you know, companies take that, but maybe that's a good business to go into because there are a lot of good components inside it, right? You know, but what happens there, right? Is it that it just ends up somewhere in your house or I guess, which is what happens to mine. I actually have one from England about 10 years ago, like, you know, like, like, because I don't know what to do with it. The phone can't work in Trinidad, but, you know, that doesn't need to have it, right? But in the companies, of course, we're using phone examples and the companies, you know, they have purchased their forklift, they have purchased their harnesses, they have purchased their tools. So asset integrity means you're taking care of all of that and there's like a record of it on a spreadsheet, right? If you, if you want to understand this, this topic a bit, asset integrity is like they have all the equipment listed out on a spreadsheet. Manufacturer, when was it purchased? Does it have to be certified? Because something's already certified. Like a crane, if it's like a crane you have, right? Does it have to be certified, right? Once for the year, twice for the year. If it's like a sling, does it have to be certified? Who is the certified body, right? Who are you sending it by every six months? Is it a fire extinguisher? How often do you service those? Is it four months? Is it six months? So asset integrity involves looking at all of that and making sure that everything is up to mark, right? So integrity standard is best at the design stage and should include designing for maintainability and ease of inspection. Um, there can be serious consequences of failing to manage the integrity of assets. These can include fire, explosions, gas release, fugitive emissions, chemical leaks. Plant and equipment must therefore be selected at the design stage that are suitable for the operating environment. Asset integrity should be maintained throughout the life of the process plant and equipment asset, sorry, life cycle analysis. This can be done by inspecting and testing as well as maintenance regime based on the following. Based on what the manufacturer says, based on what the law says, based on maybe some kind of audit you have going on, recertification, maybe based on your risk assessments and the findings of a hazard or a what-if analysis. That makes sense, right? I could just pick one. Which one to pick, though? Um, okay, I'll pick legal, right? Legal may not be easy for you all. But like... um. 
you know, we talked about slings and cranes and lifting equipment. There's actually a law in England called Lola. If any, if I have any of my degree students here, I think I have a couple of them in this class. I have Vasus. There's a law called Lola. Now we follow Lola here in Trinidad. L O L E R. Right? Take this one down. I could give you more than one law, Zana. This is the first one that came to my head, right? Lola. It stands for the lifting operation, lifting equipment regulation. This is the law by which we certify elevators in Trinidad, even though Lola is not law in Trinidad. Lola is not law in Guyana either, but everybody is certified to Lola. Right? So Lola recommends like if a piece of equipment is used to lift person. So you could think of it if it's a, um, a scissors lift, if you know what that is, a mobile elevated working platform. If it's an elevator, if it's a conveyor, Lola recommends that that be inspected once in every six months. So that's the law. That's if you go to your, well, if you go anywhere that has a functioning elevator, the certification is inside there. You see, it's every six months. Once a piece of equipment, you can take up an elevator, elevator any mall or whatever, right? It's inspected once every six months. And that's because of a legal requirement called Lola. Right? So what I said on the asset register, you'll see, let's go back to work equipment, you will see the mobile elevated working platform, you'll see six months. Right? Harnesses and anything like used then, like retractable devices, anything used to lifting. Right? People, lifting people is every six months. If it's used to lift equipment is every 12 months. So like the gantry crane I was talking about, I don't know how to draw that for you all. I hope you have an idea what I'm talking about, right? A gantry crane. Uh, used to carry pipes, right? And if it's could give you a picture, if you don't know what a gantry crane is, this is the crane structure there, right? And so it's carrying the pipes, and of course, for those, these things travel horizontally, right? So that might be a good picture of horizontal gear. But this is used to move equipment there, so that must be inspected once in every 12 months. You have the tonnage here, 10 tons, and it's supposed to see the certificate for that, saying that that must be inspected every 12 months. That'll be on the asset register, right? You can take that down, and you know, the next thing is a decent CVN exam. Right? Because this is a law. This is the actual figures for the law. Six months of persons, 12 months for lifting equipment. I'll leave it a bit. Right? Let me see if I can get this slide to move. I'll move one, right? And three months so plans for are... Sorry, go ahead. And three months for fall protection. How much? Three months quarterly. Three months of all protection. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Good. Um, two point five on this syllabus, right? Plant operation and maintenance inspection. So the heart of good maintenance is effective inspection or an effective inspection program. Inspection required when you have installed something or you have reinstalled something. It could think about a scaffold or something simpler, like like. Like you bring a generator, right? So, you know, you reinstall, maybe it had to be serviced, the pulleys had to change. The pulleys is like, you know, the, the circles in them, the metal circles, or the fan belt or the belt have to change. So you have to re-inspect it then, right? Where deterioration leads to a significant risk, for example, harsh weather, chemicals, right? You need good maintenance. Where exceptional circumstances may jeopardize safety. Again, that may be the exceptional circumstance may have been, uh, again, some natural disaster if you're talking about a scaffold, right? I don't know if you know what a tower crane is. Have you all ever seen, like, when, I mean, like, we have seen it. As I say, have you ever seen? Because I know you have seen it, right? Like, um, a couple of years ago when it had all this, the hurricanes, remember it had a year? I can't remember the year, though. It was before the pandemic. There was about like five hurricanes, something, two of them combined, and they make our next one going up in Florida, heading up to New York. And if you looked at the news and stuff, right? 
the 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 Irma and stuff you have seen a lot of tower cranes, right? They left them because and then in the in the hurricane that thing kind of came down, right? So um, you know, whatever is the exceptional circumstances, let's say nothing happened to it, let's say it did not falter, because some of them did falter in the in the real hurricanes. Well, you have to reinspect them and you can't assume then that this thing is trustworthy after such exceptional circumstances. Again, that could be a hurricane, an earthquake, something impact it. Yes, yeah, something passed and hit it, right? You have your tower crane or whatever it is your device, but something reversed and hit it, right? And so you can't assume now that, okay, every part of it is still working. You have to reinspect, right? So inspection regimes may be governed by legislation, as you see here from Lola, best practices or an internal procedure, or, I mean, there's a lot more answers to that, right? Like, like the history of breakdowns. If something is breaking down often, you need to inspect it more, right? The history of breakdowns, right? All right. Um, I think I'll move on. Starting to feel hungry. All right. Um, plant operation and maintenance testing, right? A part of the maintenance program to match required performance criteria. Testing required under legislation, such as pressure vessels, pipelines, and valves must be inspected every 10 years. Like we just talked about this one, right? Lifting equipment. You just need to remember one. Like if you ask to something now, they ask to like, um, was the stages of, uh, or they would say two stages of asset management is design and decommissioning. They ask for another two stage, right? You can talk about modification, operation, right? And what I say, and they say like, what determines then the frequency of inspection? You can just say the law, history of accidents, Right? The recommendation from a client. And if you pick something like the law, you can use the Lola example we have here. We have on the left hand side there as well, right? It have more laws in it, have caution, all kind of thing. But that's the one here, so that's the one I stuck to. All right. Plant operation, uh, maintenance. And we have maintenance again. That's the heading. This is the summary, right? So assets should be maintained in an effective state, in an effective working order, and in good repair. Maintenance log to be kept. Maintenance work should be undertaken by only competent persons to be carried out in a safe level without exposing workers, public, to unacceptable risk. Um, it, is a, it is a legal requirement under the HSW Act uh, 1974, Section 2, that employers must provide safe plants and equipment. If assets are not maintained due to wear and age, it may become unsatisfactory. Maintenance strategies can improve the life and efficiency of plants and equipment, right? Nothing too detailed here. If you don't know the law, we mentioned this law before. This is the main law for England for health and safety. This is the OSH Act, then, in case you didn't pick that up in one of the last classes we had. They don't already, they, like they don't say OSH, you know, America says OSH, Trinidad says OSH, Guyana, Grenada, Barbados, everybody says OSH, but not the Europeans, right? Um. Scotland don't say OSH either, right? Uh, so in that part of the world, then, right? They say they act as like the HSW Act. They don't really say OSH Act. It is just like the HSW Act, right? Kind of strange. But this is the OSH Act, right? And it does require the employer to provide same plants and equipment. The same in Trinidad, the same in Guyana, the same in Grenada, the same in Barbados, right? Because remember, we took our law from them. TT OSH Act, Guyana OSH Act is the same law. Right. All right. Maintenance strategy. I don't know why I start feeling hungry, right? Maintenance strategy. These can include, and I know we do it, right? Um, so maintenance strategy, that's a good headed. Right? Maintenance strategy. Uh, so we have emergency breakdown maintenance, right? Where this does not have a major effect on production or process. Opportunity maintenance during period of downtime, like a shutdown, or if one item in a batch fails, it may make sense to change the whole lot, right? So opportunity maintenance, like again, I'm just making this up, like I could use a simple example, right? So like, you know, um, well, most most machines, you all know, once it have something turning, it, it have a pulley inside of it, right? A pulley is like that and you have the belts, right? So 
maybe I'm just making this up. A pulley has grooves inside of it. I'll just draw it like that. That's what you're not seeing here. These circles have a groove, right? So those grooves tend to be worn. Now, if this pulley has to change, might as well change that one one time. And while you're at it, this belt had to change in the next six months, might as well change it one time, right? That's what they call opportunity maintenance, right? Um, the rain, rain started to fall here in San Fernando, right? So working adjustments, loose bolts identified, but it can be tightened up with operations running. Even these belts here could be tightened up if you don't know that, right? The RPMs and stuff, I think I spoke about it last week. All of those things can be adjusted. While the machine is running, you could be changing the RPM, right? A technician can do it for you, right? Let me take up something from the screen. The screen is a bit getting a bit filled up, right? But what I wanted to do, I wanted to learn them now, like break down maintenance. Okay, remember, that's the kind of question they'll say, identify two types of maintenance. Take the easiest one, break down an opportunity. Working adjustments, which are very easy for you, right? Let's go ahead. Maintenance strategies, run and repair, servicing and inspection, shutdown maintenance. Shutdown can be defined as a scheduled down period for a plant for scheduled maintenance for an extended period of time. Shutdowns provide unique opportunities to a maintenance department not normally available during standard operation or even during shorter periods or shorter shutdown periods. Plant preventative maintenance, PPM, monitored and operated at regular calendar or otherwise hourly basis. Plant preventative maintenance considers if the safety of an item of equipment depends upon the effectiveness of the installation condition. If by exposure to conditions, it will, it will lead to it being deviated from the installation conditions, resulting in a dangerous deterioration, right? That's plan preventative maintenance, um, routine condition monitoring. So anyway, I'll just explain. So plan, plan preventative maintenance, um, I mean, so it's, it's, it's according to schedule then, right? So like, um, we can go back to the gantry crane, had to be inspected every six months, and it's time. So that's plan preventative maintenance, right? Routine condition monitoring. This is like you are looking at a crane, or you're looking at a pump, you're looking at a motor, sounds okay, doesn't seem to be overheated when you touch it. That's routine condition monitoring, all right? Of course, if you are, just like your vehicles, right? So like you would know your vehicle, you start up your vehicle, you realize, okay, it's something a bit funny. That's still routine condition monitoring, right? So the same thing for the industry. Operators could tell, you look at a lever gauge, um, you know, you look at um, some sensor there, right? And it seems, you know, like it's just within specification, that's routine condition monitoring. If you see it going a little bit out, Maybe an either to keep the eyes out for it, something may be happening anyway, right? Corrosion causes and prevention. We are now on slide 17. Already told we don't finish by now. I, that's why I said any more. One last. By the way, the rain is down. So if you hear me shouting, because I'm upstairs. Right? I know you all don't hear it. But psychologically, but again, there is any background now. You tend to increase the voice too. There's only we play about the video I hear. I hear myself shouting, but I try to keep my tone normal then, right? The way that I was telling you, Zoom has a filter. Zoom filters all the background noise, right? So corrosion is a tendency of a metal to return to its natural state via oxidation. It's a nice definition, right? Causes of corrosion can include galvanic corrosion where you have dissimilar metals in contact. And that is something about ionization, but we could just take it that out for now anyway, right? Pitting, stress corrosion, erosion corrosion, corrosion fatigue, high temperature oxidization, hydrogel, embrittlement. Some of these are on the slide itself. 
So we can get there, right? Corrosion can be prevented by two main principles, surface coating, insulation by a protective coating, metallic flame such as gas, such as galvanizing, electroplating, molten metal spraying, vanishes and paints. Oxide coating, such as anonizing, etc., where you have corrosion resistant materials, certain metals and alloys that can withstand temperature, pressure, pH, steam velocity and agitation and the rate of heat transfer. Same heading, right? Um, but with offshore now. So corrosion causes and prevention for the offshore industry. At the design stage, corrosion is prevented by using carbon, manganese, well, combination, CM and steel. So that's a good idea. You should probably learn that. We ask you how to control corrosion. You can recommend using, you know, at the design stage, this is the best example, carbon manganite. This is the same example from the textbook, right? Corrosion control practices include selection of materials, steels, corrosion resistant alloys, plastics, if you could, hard plastics, something called tomosetting plastics, chemical treatment and corrosion inhibitors, surface coating protection, process and environment control, um, true, well, control true, for instance, dehumidification. I think we came across something like de-wetting and de-watering in one of the first lessons, right? Cathodic protection, initial design. Now, some of these things have a bit, as I mentioned, the word ionization. I don't know how much chemistry you have to know now. But anodic and cathodic is when you kind of strip the metal of its ions. Don't want to go too much into this, right? Not, not ions as you think, but this kind of ion, ion. All elements is made up of, well, all matter is made up of atoms, right? An atom, like carbon is an atom, right? Carbon, right? Will have atoms in it then, right? So... If you strip this, which happens, right? You can actually form the ion of, of, of carbon. And I think carbon may form. If it's negative, I believe it's cathodic. I think if it's positive, if it's a positive charge remains in it, it is actually anodic, right? But these things are, if, let me just make this thing clear for you, right? Um, these stages is what causes corrosion, right? H, hydrogen by itself doesn't cause corrosion. But when it gets it into the, like the anodic or the cathodic stage, it, it carries a charge with it. And it's a charge is what causes corrosion. Hence they say in cathodic protection to avoid this then, to avoid it getting into one of those um, unstable states. If you want a chemistry lesson, I'll just repeat it again. I'll repeat it again. And I'll do sodium this time. Sodium. You find this in salt, like sea, like like seawater, but sodium by itself doesn't have a charge. If you have a pack of salt home after the class, go and watch the pack of salt. You see any mark in it, any CL, right? So salt water, including the offshore industry, consists of salt. But things happen, right? That's what they say it in nature. That scientists not too sure then why things become unstable. Sodium by itself doesn't carry a charge. Any chemistry people here? But life as it would be is not perfect. So something has happened. They don't know what. This sodium will become unstable. And if it becomes unstable, I believe sodium carries a positive charge. It doesn't carry a negative. Sodium, if it becomes unstable, it carries a positive charge. And that's like the ionic state of sodium. There are two ionic states, anodic and cathodic. But when you get into those states, you are unstable. In other words, then the sodium will start to attack the metal now. Like this, it doesn't do anything. But like this, it starts to cause corrosion to your pipes, right? So you want to kind of go to your pipes, you put it in the offshore industry. We saw some of that. You want to have it with like anti wetting agents. You want to have it coated. That's what you see here. It's not really cathodic, but it's cathodic protection to prevent this thing getting into the unstable states, right? 
initial design, right? Hopefully that wasn't too much chemistry for you. The long and short, things happen and normal things has become unstable. Sometimes and they, when they become unstable, it starts to attack the metal. So normal atoms don't always stay normal. But they refer to it as a phenomenon. They're not too sure why. Life is like that. Sometimes you're good, sometimes you're bad. <laughs> so the, the sound is not sure what has caused something to become unstable, but it does. You know? Moving along. All right, competency and training. I'm looking at the time. I guess we wouldn't be able to finish, right? But uh, something doesn't change. We'll never be able to reach it. It's exactly 2020 us, right? So what I could do If competency and training is one slide, seems to be, there seems to be another topic here. Risk-based maintenance and inspection strategy. I think I'll stop. I think we could look at our paper. Let's just do one slide and stop right here because this seems to be the start of something else. Like all of this is continuing here, right? So yes, we have some stuff to do Wednesday still. But we'll finish this. Uh, thank God I had the time to send you. I think I sent it late last night. Came back from classes and I'm um, uploading videos. And then I realized, I said, maybe we'll finish. So let me just try to send you the PowerPoint still, right? Um, let me read this one slide. We'll stop a little bit and look at our passage by the next eight minutes, right? So competency and training, asset integrity, maintenance and inspection require a high level of skill, knowledge, and competence. Let me read out, right? Asset integrity management, AIM, can take account of this. Competence can avoid human errors and maintenance errors from unsafe acts. Um, I'll explain. Asset integrity, maintenance, and inspection requires a high level of skill, knowledge, and competence. Please remember what they're talking about, right? They're talking about maintaining the asset register here. The list with all of the equipment in it. Right? And the person that that's given to in some companies, it may be the safety. In some companies, it may be the facilities manager. Right? That's called the asset integrity management plan. Like they give you all the equipment. It's on a spreadsheet. It does be a hell of a thing. I, just, I mean, just to tell you, it's a hell of a thing. To maintain it. So that's what you seen up here. Like you had to be on top of your game. You had to know like what equipment coming up for inspection, when the extinguishers are due, when the forklift trucks are due, if you have vehicles on it, when the vehicle inspections due, right? And that's just a hell of a thing to maintain if you are the one doing it as a safety, right? Remember, there are some companies that expect the safety to do everything. But most big companies have a facilities manager that does that, right? So I'll stop there. Um, I had a past paper, so let's kind of glance that. But is where I put it, right? Um, I think I had the syllabus open to begin with. So it's supposed to be up here to the supervisor or this any spot, right? Um, hmm. let's see it here. And I try to minimize all the close off of it, right? Um, I'm not seeing it, right? But I'll open it back, I'll open it back from the home screen here, right? It's just that uh, I know we started, I opened it, but maybe as I got into the syllabus, all right? Okay, let me share it with you, and I don't think y'all can see it. Uh, It's in my screen, but you're not, I don't think you'll see that, right? Tell me if you've seen it now, you're going to see how you would see. Management of International Oil and Gas Operational Safety. Are you all seeing that? Slide? Yeah, okay, good, good. All right. Um. So your typical paper looks like this. 11 questions to do short answers. 
uh, emergency plan. This is a nice question, but right? the contents of any that's that's a nice question, right? Um, I think we came across that definition. So let me ask them what was in it. And I'm going to try to bring this up a bit bigger for you all. Right? Um, oh, this is a nice one. I mean, I mean and some of it is really common sense, right? So many wells are used to join pipe work to vessels and pipe work to pipe work in the process industries. Outline why should, sorry, outline why wells should be inspected regularly. Just a four marks, that's easy. Why would you want to inspect, you know, welding regularly? Right? By the way, the old participants is to have some hints. So we can read here, they will see a little bit of hints. So they have candidates providing some correct answers, including checking the integrity of the weld. So that's one of the answers. I think you want to check also for things like uh, deterioration. You want to ensure, um, you know, the competence of the welder. Maybe even to recommend it for future jobs. That's four answers right there. Sure. Right. However, a few mentioned implementation of a preventative strategy rather than a reactive strategy. So this is two answers here. Why should wells be regularly inspected? to maintain the integrity of the wells and to implement a preventative strategy. Outline why, sorry, outline reasons why a well may be defective. And you can talk about corrosion and, you know, you can talk about, um, anybody have an answer they could talk about here? We, we just did one beside it, corrosion. <clears throat> why a well may be defective? What do you think is the answer for that? What's the easy answer for that? A well, a well, a piece of work, and the well wasn't good. So, why is the answer for that? Why, why, why isn't the well good? Could it be possible that it's due to the well as well? Yes or no? Sure. Yeah. It could be that the welder is not does not have the years of experience or the skill set to weld the equipment properly. Correct. Right. Yeah. So I was telling you all. They give some hints here. We have candidates provided answers that demonstrated a better understanding than in part A. So I don't understand why. So these are comments person anyway. Better answers from candidates included the welder's incompetence. Right? Another answer. The person could have been competent, but they have a poor technique. Spot welding now. You know, you know, few candidates outlined ineffective e-treatment. So that could have been, so there's three answers there. And you can get one for yourself, you know, the environment where the uh, well was being done may have been somewhat offshore, resulting in metallic attack from corrosion. Anodic or cathodic, if you want to learn your work. Four answers right there. I'll stop, right? Because I have to have another class. I'll process it. You're going to start just now, right? Look, we cannot do this one. Outline fire precautions that may be included in a hot work permit. You want eight things in a hot work permit. Right? Um, folks, I want to... Now, I know you all have been... Well, not you all, but one or two of you have been doing your assignments, right? The assignments and the group chat and stuff. I don't know if anybody want to take a pity of this and do this question. This is a nice question. I could do this at the top of my head, but I don't have time. We kind of did it today. But this is respect to fire. Fire precautions. Not explosion. We did what? We did hot work. We did confined space. This is normal fire. Where's the fire precautions that should be in our permit to work? Emergency rescue, firefighting equipment. Let me have some here. Right? You want to take a picture of this? Those of us who, if you're not using your phone, and if you can get this done... I really don't have the time to send it now because I had it into another class right now. And uh, you all remember Sunday again. I'm not here hoping to meet up Nikisha in Guyana. There. That's my good friend. Right? And I'm um, coming across Tuesday evening. Right? Okay. So I'll stop the recording here. Let me just call the road because I do have another class. I realize it's just seven of us. So what I can do... um. 
I can just get your seven names and let us see who was here. Excuse uh, me, sir. Yes. Hi. Um, so this coming week, I'll be more free. So I'll hand in all my assignments one time because of my work schedule, I haven't been able to yeah. finish the assignments. Not a problem, right? And like I said, I would be there this week to train your company in the same course anyway. Yes, sir. Right? Yeah. Okay, I want to do this quickly, right? Kyle? Yes, sir. Okay, good. Enjoy the rest of your Sunday. Lauren? Yes, sir. Roger? Yes, sir. Amrish? Yeah, okay, good. Amrish? Imara? I'll put a recording up this evening, right? Ram Singh? Alicia, Harry Charan, I think that's so her. Yes, Alicia. Yes, sir, brother. Steven is here. Yeah, Vasus is not here. Sharkis is not here. Alim, Elizabeth is here. Sharada, Amara is here, I believe. I didn't see Glenn and I didn't see Mikhail. Right? So let me see if I have the eight. One, two, or oh, seven. Seven. Okay, good. Folks, I'll see you all back on Wednesday evening, right? The last month. Teaching class in Trinidad, anyway, right? All the rest, all the best, everybody, for the rest of the Sunday. I have another class around too, right? So I wish you all the best, and I'll see you all back uh, on Wednesday evening. Bye.